Good afternoon and welcome. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to give a little bit of context. Today's talk is part of um, our efforts to grow metal studies at UVic over the past uh, two, three years. We've had a symposium, a student-led conference, a series of speakers, uh, movie screenings, and even uh, a class all devoted to the study of metal and its subcultures. So uh, if you're a student at UVic or just in the local and interested in metal studies, keep track of our events. Hopefully soon we're going to have a dedicated website that will both archive um, all of these uh, and serve as a focal point for future events. Um, Tilt and probably the best way to keep up on things is to join the Heavy Metal UVic Facebook page. You don't have to be a student at UVic to join Heavy Metal UVic and uh, you can find out more stuff there. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Casey Lazar, the president of Heavy Metal UVic, who's actually not here right now because he's helping uh, Agalak with their gear. So he's downtown. Um, Casey has been very instrumental in uh, organizing and in helping a lot of not just metal shows uh, in, uh, in Victoria and in the region, but also metal studies at UVic. Um, to the talk. Uh, our speaker, Don Anderson, is one of the founding members and the guitarist of the band Agalog. But you probably know all about that, so I'm not going to talk about that in my introduction. Also, it's part of what he'll talk about in his talk. Uh, we're fortunate that he's able to take time during his tour with Agalach to put on his academic hat, as it were, although really he's wearing both hats um, in the, today. Don is a professor, professor of English at SUNY Westchester Community College. His, re his research focuses on critical theory, American literature, horror, exploit exploitation, and cult cinema, with a specific interest in Italian cult cinema. And you may have caught in the blurb that he sent us that he talks a little bit about the influence of cinema on Agalox. So you can see how the two kind of mesh. His, pub his publications include How the Horror Film Broke Its Promise, Hyper Real Horror, and Ruggiero Diodato's Cannibal Holocaust, which was published in the Journal of Horror Studies in 2013. He also has a, a forthcoming article in the Journal of Gothic Studies. His talk today is titled, Weaving Influences, Positioning Agalach in the History of Heavy Metal. Please join me in welcoming Don Anderson to you. Thank you. Uh, so, so first thing, a major disappointment, um, because when I was invited, um, and I want to thank Professor Barin and Sayers, who we go back very, very far in grad school together, for inviting me. Um, I'm very, very flattered and still slightly, you know, uh, processing everything, um, being invited to talk about Agalock and not American literature or William Burroughs or something like this. But <clears throat> the first major disappointment is that as I began developing what I wanted to present, I found myself actually referencing the band Atheist more than Agalock, so I apologize that. <laughs> so hopefully you enjoy the work of Atheist and even Gorguts. I'm going to talk about Gorguts a little bit. And why does that have to do with Agalock? I don't know. but. What I want to begin doing is, I'll just introduce myself a little bit too, for those of you I'm assuming, I don't like to be narcissistic, but I assume you're familiar with, the, with my work in some weird way. I've never been in this position before. But um, a little bit about my academic side. I, I did my undergraduate work at Washington State University in Vancouver, Washington, the other Vancouver. And uh, like maybe many of you, I loved school, I loved studying, and I loved being kind of an escape from the world, and I didn't want to leave, and so I went to graduate school. And uh, I attended Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, just not too far from here. I did my master's there and then went to University of Washington for my doctorates. And the whole time that was happening, the seed that I had sown back when I was 18 years old kept growing behind me and saying, wait a minute, you have to go on tour. You have to go on tour. We have a record to write. And I had to, became very used to wearing these two hats of being a musician and an academic. And it's challenging, but also very rewarding because, as I'll talk about, a lot of the stuff I do in academia has impacted Agalock in, 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 similar, in some significant ways. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, and I think, I think I want to begin with the idea that whenever I tell my colleagues, right, some other professors in the hallway of the English department at the SUNY, they find out what I do, and I don't advertise it because it always becomes a really awkward discussion of like, 
they assume immediately that you're some garage band. Or, and they, they don't see anything between a garage band and Metallica, like that whole. <laughs> and then they find out, wait, you're going to Europe? Or like, how do you do this? And you have, you've been around for 20 years almost? It's insane, why aren't you a millionaire? And why are you a professor? And, and then it's like, then it, how do you, and then, and, then it, and then the question becomes, well, what kind of music is it? And then I'm like, I, I just say heavy metal. And then, no, no, like, what kind, what bands? And then like, and then, you, then I feel like a prick because then I'm like, they can tell, like, I, I already am nervous about saying, because I'm like, I don't think they'll know what I'm talking about. So I was like, over, they don't know. I was like, God speed you black emperor, they don't know. So they become this really horrible kind of, like, Samuel Beckett play, where we're just, <laughs> nothing's happening. And, and, and then, but then they'll look me up online, and they'll, and they'll be really surprised. But, you know, the thing I always say, and I think many of you will agree with me, that heavy metal has traditionally been a very, very, very intellectual genre of music. Case in point, when I was maybe seven, eight years old, and listening to Iron Maiden, right, and I heard Rhyming the Ancient Mariner. And you know this song, I hope, I hope, right? Right? <laughs> and I'm like, what is this? Who is Samuel Taylor Coleridge? And I immediately went to the library and checked out the, the prose poem and read it intensely. And especially looking for the passages that Bruce Dickinson quotes in the actual song and literally trying to interpret it and doing work between why is Maiden interested in this? How has this affected our Maiden? That's the kind of work you do in an English department, right? That's interpreting literature, it's making those sort of connections. And so already at a very young age, I was being primed for, being primed for school, you know? And, and it's not just Iron Maiden, but I think overall, metalheads are scholars, right? And think about your own experiences listening to this particular genre of music. If you were like me, every album you got, you would stare at the cover forever, listen to it. Um, I can't speak for the MP3H, but in the old days, and you would read the <laughs> lyrics intensely, and you would be even you would read the thanks lists intensely. Even the thanks, I want to know who recorded it, who was the producer. I want to know what bands they're thinking, because if I don't know those bands, I'm gonna go find them. <laughs> you know, this is how we used to do things. You know, like uh, if I saw a band wearing a shirt, and I would see the logo, I go, I'm gonna go check them out. Like if Obituary was wearing a shirt of a band I never heard of, I'd go find that band. That's research, right? That's making connections. That's being a scholar. That kind of intense dedication. That kind of intense reading and looking for everything and you know especially right now the amount of literature on heavy metal is growing profoundly right with the work of like jeff wagner bazillion points uh the compendium of the slayer magazine and it's 10 magazines there's this real drive to archive the history of heavy metal and to begin making sense of it so i guess today i'd like to intervene into that a little bit and try to provide uh, my own sort of thinking on a theoretical level about what's happening in the history of heavy metal and how do we think the history of heavy metal because most of the work done outside of academia is very anecdotal, very historical, right? This happened and this happened, here's what happened at this point, and very linear, A leads to B leads to C. So my first instinct is to resist that a little bit and try to think about something different. And so first I want to sort of provide a context, a framework for thinking about heavy metal as doing a kind of history before trying to, I guess, in a very narcissistic way insert myself into it. It's very awkward for me to do, but nonetheless, I'll do it, I'll do it, because it's, it's, it's the point of the talk. <laughs> so my first thought is that it's not weird that I'm the guitar player from Maglock doing a guest, this talk or lecture, whatever you want to call it, at the University of Victoria. It feels weird and strange when I tell people they're like, they, they don't understand it. But I think it makes perfect sense because you're all scholars and you're bred to be scholars. And I would say the same thing for the genres of jazz. I think jazz people are insanely cult. And it doesn't matter what's going on in the mainstream, you know, because the mainstream's got Kenny G, but when you're seriously into jazz, you're listening to Mingus, you're listening to Ornette Coleman, you're listening to these sort of people, and you're doing that kind of research. And I think the classical world is the same way. I don't know about country or pop music, that's another thing. So my goal is to sort of find a way of thinking about heavy metal. And, and, and I think heavy metal's worth, you know, because I see there's a kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of discomfort with intellectualizing, particularly movements or things that seem to resist you know, commodification, to resist being institutionalized, right? But that's very much the history of the academy. I mean, there was a time when you didn't read Mark Twain. There was a time when you shouldn't read Kerouac or William Burroughs. You know, but now it's like standard reading. And so I don't think anything can be you know, left out of thinking rigorously and meaningfully about it. Um, particularly because, I would say, heavy metal raises questions about history, about genre, about how music is developed. And so that's what I want to approach. So I do think I, I am not at all 
apologetic about being academic and 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 and, and you know uh, polysyllabic about the genre because I think it raises important questions. And so the question I want to ask that I've been really contemplating, trying to understand is if we can agree, and we could probably sit here and nerd out and debate about what's the first heavy metal record. But just for time, and for sake of time, can we all agree that the first heavy metal record is Black Sabbath's debut record? So we got 1970s, a nice square year. We can work up easily. It's 45 years old, right? <laughs> so, you know, of course, the word appears in William Burroughs' Soft Machine, and we can talk about Iron Butterfly, Steppenwolf, Blue Cheer, and so on and so on and so forth. But really, let's just go ahead and say Sabbath is where it begins. So if, that's, if we agree, then heavy metal is 45 years old. That is very, very, very young. Very young. I'm 36. I've almost lived the entirety of that genre that I participated in. It, it makes me feel old, but it blows my mind that it is that young and has progressed so quickly. Right? So let's even go... Here's the thing. So for me, how did we get from Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath to an album like Atheist's Unquestionable Presence? To, please tell me, raise your hand. You know this record, Unquestionable Presence. Right in my line, he's right there. I can see you. <laughs> After the event, we'll, we'll go listen to it. I have it on my iPod. <laughs> but uh, that record is so radical of a departure from all the conventions of heavy metal. I don't know how we got there. That's my first thing. I thought, how the hell, in 21 years, did we go from these like, very basic power chords, great songs, but simple power chords, to this incredibly technical and strange and Amazing record. When that came out in 91, I'm old enough to, to remember what it was like when that record dropped and I heard it for the first time. I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if we look at another, another genre of music, so we look at classical, it took, I, I can't do the math off the top of my head because I'm an English professor, but it took, what, 400 years, 350, 350 years to go from Bach to Scherenberg, right? To go from the Baroque period to 12 tone, to serialism, to the atonality, right? It took a long, long time. And so my question is, how is that possible that in this genre, it was a, just a flash, it was boom, we are now atheist, we are now cynic, or even another great record, Gore Guts is Obscura, which, how is that? And what I first want to sort of, you know, would approach that is, I'm really fascinated by this concept that's going around a lot, has been for a while, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, the philosopher Slavo Žižek, maybe, yes, okay, he has a new recent book on what he calls the event. And I think the title is Event, A Philosophical Journey Through a Concept. And I want to start with that definition. So in the beginning of his book, uh, Zizek defines the event as an effect that exceeds its own causes and that retroactively determines its causes or reasons. And this is a very strange thing. How do we think the event? It's something that happens that appears outside a kind of linear timeline, like A leads to B leads to C. Something comes out that's so radical that we don't see how we got there. Like, you, maybe you agree. If you don't, we can talk. But it's easy to see Black Sabbath going to Iron Maiden. It's easy to see that going to Metallica. That makes pretty good sense. It's gradual. Up, stuff gets a little faster, right? You know, but that makes perfect But then something happens that seems so out of the linear trajectory that it literally recreates its own past. It's only after Atheist Unquestionable Presence comes out that we can be like, now I can see how we got there. But it wasn't like walking up a staircase. It's only after the effect. So I will define atheist unquestionable present as an effect, a rupture, perhaps, in the history of heavy metal, and Gorbets as well. And so another good helpful definition is Michel Foucault's definition of the event that he gets out of his uh, very, very amazing article called Nietzsche, Genealogy and History. And he's also working against the idea of history as this linear trajectory that reaches towards enlightenment and everybody's great. Um, he defines the event, I'll read it really slowly because it's much more complex, but I think way more helpful than Zizek. <coughs> he writes that, an event is the reversal of a relationship of forces, right? It's the one. And the usurpation of power. And most importantly, I think the appropriation of a vocabulary turned against those who had once used it. And that last phrase I want to work with a little bit, you know, because I sometimes think about this when I'm teaching gender politics or things like this. You know, uh, you see the, there's a feminist magazine called Bitch in the U.S. I don't know. I don't know. I can't speak for Canada. But this sort of reappropriating the very terms that was used to demonize, to denigrate minority culture, minorities, right? Okay? And this sort of reappropriation of it. You think also to the N-word in black culture, right? And that by doing that, by taking the vocabulary that was previously used against them and owning it, sort of, I think, disengages the power of the dominating class, right? And so I like this because I think Gorgas Obscura, as an event, 
It's so incredibly radical, it doesn't use the same vocabulary that began with Black Sabbath. It's so far from the primordial beginning, you know, because uh, if you listen to that first record, Luke LeMay is, is doing a classical technique on the neck of the guitar. Maybe you've seen it on YouTube videos. He's scraping the strings, right? And this is a classical technique called polenio that's uh, popular by people like Christoph Penderecki, you know? Uh, Trinity for the Victims of Hiroshima. It's a very violent piece of music. It sounds like insects crawling everywhere. And it's done by uh, using the back end of the bow, or Ligeti, or more uh, contemporary uh, Helmut Lachtemann. And he's working outside of the genre of heavy metal. And so then my next question is, well, what causes an event? Like, if we can follow Sabbath, Maiden, Metallica, Slayer, and then get into death metal, you know, we can see where Amorphous, Benediction, Carcass, that all makes sense. But what causes an event? And this is when I want to introduce my second term. So we have event. And the term I want to use is accelerationism. And <clears throat> I'm borrowing it from recent critics of, you might say, sort of recent critics of capitalism, sort of post-Marxist critics, criti uh, critics of capitalism. And the guy that sort of coined the term is named Benjamin Noyes. And the basic argument about accelerationism is that, and I don't know how much you've, any of you have studied sort of Marxist theory, but the idea that capitalism is doomed to fail because within capitalism we have contradictions. Right? So capitalism requires scarcity in order to produce. Uh, capitalism requires selling the same thing to a bunch of people who all believe that they're individuals. And that one way to defeat capitalism is to accelerate it and actually encourage it to go faster and so that you basically run it into the ground. I disagree with this. I don't think capitalism will ever go away. I, the best you can be is like, you know, co-op markets and things like this that just become the kind of acne on the face of capitalism. But it's, it's always <laughs> going to be there. It's always going to be uh, commodifying resistance and selling it back to you on your Facebook feed. It's never going to go away. So, but I want to apply this to music because the question is then, events happen because, <clears throat> and this is a very simple explanation, I think you might know where I'm going with this. We grew up, all of us here, grew up in the age of mechanical reproduction, right? There's a, coin, a term coined by Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, meaning that genres that were born in the age of recording, distribution, you know, uh, making records, spreading music, I argue, makes that genre grow quicker. I mean, like, like think for a minute, what if Schoenberg, yeah. all right, so the Viennese 12 tones go, what if they tape traded? <laughs> Right, because at that time you had three guys doing that. You had three guys doing, and they were students. Right, was Schoenberg was a professor, and he had Weber and Berg, and they were doing twelve tone music. It was just those three. Had they tape traded, you would have probably had way more twelve tone serialists working. Right? What if Miles Davis had a Bandcamp page? <laughs> I mean, jazz moved quickly too. It's, I mean, you go from Duke Ellington to Charles Mingus. It's a relatively short period of time. Right. But, but they're within the age of mechanical reproduction, within the age of like, hey, did you hear this record? Check out this record, right? I grew up in the tape trading age. I didn't grow up in the MP3 age like all of you. You have it even faster. There is, and it blows my mind, and I'm not gonna be a curmudgeon about it, but, because I have students all the time that are like this, you can hear anything at any time, at any place. That's all, and the, the, the funny thing is, that's normal to a lot of you. <laughs> Whereas to me, it's like, to me, it's still shocking. You know, like our drummer, I don't know, he had a great blog called The Cosmic Curse, Aesop, right? And I discovered, I had no idea that South Africa had a, psych, uh, South Africa had a psychedelic scene. I had no idea. And now I do. And I listen to it, and at some level that has to affect how I think about music and genres and things like this. And that influences me. So I want to go ahead and label heavy metal as an accelerated musical genre. It moves really quick due to the technological advancements and mechanical reproduction. Because look, how did atheists happen? Well, they probably bought an Alan Holdsworth CD. They bought a Mahavish New Orchestra CD. And they're like, we can incorporate this into heavy metal and have this thing called death jazz, <laughs> right? I don't know if that could have happened in the 70s. I don't know. I think it had to happen at least in the 90s, right? <clears throat> so the accelerated genre, as I call it, it exists, it's based on, it's constituted by the means of reproduction, whether it's simply dubbing a tape, putting out an LP, or streaming, or ripping MP3s, these are all ways to radically disseminate information in such a fast and quick and accessible way that artists working today in any of their genres can't help but be influenced by just about everything. And that's definitely something that Agaloc is a part of, and something that we're very, very conscious of in our earlier period, and still today. 
Um, and so my sort of final claim then in this history before I bring in where Aglock sits in it is like, I feel like if I push on this idea that heavy metal is an accelerated genre, I believe it's the accelerationism of heavy metal that produces events, produces records that seem such a radical departure, that exceed their own causes, that we can only make sense of after their emergence, right? That's what I think is happening. And I feel like we're going to keep going faster, faster and faster. We're just on the ferry here, right? I look around, everybody's on their phones, everybody's on their tablets, everybody's processing information. And that's accelerationism. Accelerationism says, work faster, play faster, enjoy faster. Right? And that's what's happening. And I feel like we will continue to have these radical events in the genre at such a rate that the event will become the norm and that the definition, the term heavy metal, will begin to lose all meaning. And I, I predict this for most genres. I mean, I see it with Agalot, people trying to, s to describe us. No one ever just says, heavy metal band from the Northwest. <laughs> you know, and it almost feels provocative for me to say that when my colleagues say, well, what kind of music do you play? Heavy metal. But, I mean, if you've heard the work we do, it's a lot of different things, right? It, and when you say heavy metal, they think, oh, you sound like Dio or something. <laughs> or worse, they'll be like, no offense, but they'll be like, like, like Baron Manson? Like Slipknot? Like, what are you talking about? And then, then I have to like... So no, it's not really metal, and you get all the leaders. <laughs> and you gotta like break that down for them. <laughs> you know, and then, they, then they, you find yourself in these really, you know, crazy political moments. Um, <laughs> but you can see that, right? Because what do people call us? I see it all the time. It's like these really complex, tortured, Byzantine, hyphenated phrases, black, post-black metal, shoegaze, gray, whatever, you know? And there's this real moment, we were talking about this in the car, me and Sean, like, we were talking about traditions of philosophy, because you said that over here, the tradition is very analytic, mind very continental, and I'm like, that's Derrida, right? That's Derrida. That's the moment where in the search for meaning, it becomes more meaningless. Because the very things that make it possible to say what is, it makes it impossible, I think. And that's deconstruction, and that's what's happening. It's a futile attempt, it's a vain attempt. And that's because we live in an accelerated genre with heavy metal, and events are becoming the norm, I'm sure you might be able to name up records. I mean, Despel Omega was an event. I think the later Abigail records are events. They radically change how we think about music in, in tremendous ways. Okay, so that's, that's how I see heavy metal as a history right now. Not as something that nicely leads up to, here's Black Sabbath, all right, here's the newest Crawlis record, nice smooth line. No, it's not a smooth line. There's ruptures, there's breaks, there's depths, okay? And that's how I prefer to do history. Now, where does Aglock fit in this? There's an, the, impulsive, the impulsive part of me wants to say, leave it to the critics. You know, that's not the artist's responsibility. How much responsibility do I have to make sense of what we do beside my own private thoughts about why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, because I can remember very much well in, during a session in The Mantle. Do you know the record The Mantle? Yes. Okay. I, never, I don't want to assume too much, you know, because, again, it's the narcissism. But there was a time in that studio session where I was like, I was talking with John, the other guitar player, Volk, I said, I have to do a kind of bluesy guitar solo here. Right? It's in the Hawthorne Passage, I think part, part one. And like, it fits perfectly, and we were very nervous. We were very nervous about a note bending in a bluesy way. Just that. <laughs> it was like, people started saying, sounds like Robert Cray, sounds like Buddy Guy. I'm like, no, it does not sound like any of those guys. But it's, it's, it, the music is calling for it. And even the, there's that piano part on Hawthorne Passage that's like borderline honky-tonk. You take away all the shoegazy guitar parts, and all of a sudden, it's, it's like, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a ragtime piece. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what happens. So let me, I'll talk about the mantle in particular, because I know that this record is held in somewhat high esteem by people. I mean, again, I don't, I don't, it's, it's me being objective. Critics have said this shit, not me. I don't know. But I, you know, and I think a lot about that record because it's a really weird record to me, and it was a weird record for all of us. And what, what happened then? Well, first of all, I don't know how many remember, but the years 2000 to about 2003, metal was in really poor state. You had the new metal, the sort of rap metal, and that, that's fine. If that's your thing, that's fine. It's not like that. But it just, we just fell out of love with it. For a long time, John and I just did not listen to metal at all. <clears throat> and fortunately, we were in a period where we could listen and explore, and we got exposed to a lot of different types of music. Right? John got overdosed on electronica, 
listening to bands like Ottecker, Coil, uh, Antarctica, Boards of Canada, uh, Aphex Twin, okay? And bringing that influence in, uh, we were both getting into neo-folk, the whole World Serpent scene, the Crew 93, Death in June, Soul Invictus. And, and we're getting way into like singer-songwriters like Nick Cave, okay, Leonard Cohen, Tom Waits, um, and uh, Swans, Godspeed You Black Emperor, the whole post-rock thing. I remember when me and John were living, more or less, the other guys were living elsewhere, and it was just him and I. We'd go out at night, um, you know, we'd get some drinks, some beers, or whatever, and we went to see Godspeed You Black Emperor in 2001 before they totally like, became this cult phenomenon. And I think this is sort of ties into the accelerationist thing is that I was in the audience watching Godspeed play, and I'm like, they're tremolo picking, you know? They're picking really, really fast. I'm like, that's what we do. <laughs> it's just they're doing it on the higher strings, you know? But I'm like, how is that not Emperor? I mean, at one point, like, Godspeed to Black Emperor and Emperor. <laughs> I didn't even know I did that. That's totally, that's, that's not even an intentional pun. But it's not even really my pun. But that, I was like, we, we should steal that. You know, <laughs> and, you, and this is the dirty, the dirty truth is that most of Aglock is just stolen from not just metal bands. That's what you would all yeah. notice then. It's like, oh, that's clearly Catatonia. It's clearly over. But we steal from a lot of things. But I was like, we can absorb that. And so we did. And the manacle came out of that. And there's definitely parts in the manacle where it's like, clearly, you guys really like God, we do like Emperor. Or clearly, these guys are listening to a lot of swans. So it was a moment where we had access to everything. And the one record in particular is a band called Sand, just S-A-N-D, not the German crop rock band. We bought it thinking it was the German crop rock band. <laughs> Instead, it was better. The album's called The Dynamic Curve. And you should totally, you can just, just you, you pull up on YouTube right now. You, you can do this, this is the greatest thing. You have no idea how great, this is why I sound like an old man. You have no idea how good you have it. I can like, drop the most obscure record possible, and boom, there it is. So do that after the, after the discussion. Um, that record, was fundamental in the mantle. It was found by accident, but it also occurred because of, we heard about this band and we wanted to find a record, we mistook this one record, it became something and it deeply affected how we thought about music and thought about writing. All right, so I would say we wrote faster, we thought faster, the possibilities of what we could do musically opened up tremendously because we were listening to so much stuff and it was easy to listen to that stuff and incorporated into the work that we were doing. Um, and that's where I see Aglock. Aglock is part of this accelerationist, I'm not going, I will not say the mantle was an event or something, I, that's for you, I don't know. I can't do it, but I can definitely say that if it wasn't for the sort of accelerationist moment in the genre, I don't think the mantle could exist. The mantle is still to me a very strange record. And we're still very, 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 uh, don't know what to think of it. I, I, I felt it confused. I have to admit, when I was doing press for this, the third record, Ashes Against the Grain, I remember saying, this is more cohesive. This Ashes is a much more cohesive record. We were totally fumbly, young 20-somethings, didn't know what we were doing in the mantle. There was moments where we had no idea what we were doing. I'm shocked anybody likes that record. <laughs> I'm so confused. But that record to me is really, again, it's very indicative of, wow, this band, these guys listen to a lot of different stuff. And that would not be possible had we not existed in this particular moment. So that's how I see Aglock fitting with that. And I think this brings up, you mentioned cinema, and I mentioned you know, the influence of cinema. Film as well. I mean, uh, more so than music in many ways, the access to film is tremendous, easy, easy to access. And that has a tremendous influence on how we think now as well. Um, that's, I, I, I don't know, is that too short? I just, I, I, I didn't time test it, but I know there might be questions and I can further develop these concepts of the event and the celebrationist genre. And this is something I'm hoping to sort of put together as a as some sort of scholarly project, uh, an article. So I really would be interested in any kind of questions you might have about Aglock, about uh, academia, about negotiating Aglock and academia, kind of an Agal academia. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> Or, uh, or, or any of you think what I, I, I'm saying is, 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 is problematic, you know, this, you, you take me down, it's fine, it's, 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 it's great. So if there's any questions about the, the ideas I have on History of Agalog, please ask them, ask them now. Do you need me to moderate or are you good? Oh, I, 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 I don't know, what, I've, never, I've never been in this position before, how does it, you know, no, you go ahead, just raise your hand, just as I class, right, I guess, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say, what are you most impressed with, like in terms of what you guys have done for your album work? 
What am I most like impressed with or like happy with? Kind yeah. of. Okay. I, I mean, mean, most happy with as a musician. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Oh. If you were to finally be fully happy, maybe you would quit and be like, okay, I've reached my zenith, you know, and yeah. it's all downhill from there. And we're very, we're very susceptible to this idea because we've seen bands who we should have stopped a long time ago, you know, but um, always the last thing we've done. So for, for me, the Serpent the Sphere is something I'm very, very proud of. I feel like we finally kind of got it. We got the right engineer, we got the right studio, we got the right gear. Um, so for me, that's the happiest one. The Mantle always has a soft spot in my heart because of its sort of legacy over time. Um, but in terms of Agalock, I would say it has to be a sphere. Serpent the sphere. Yeah. Gentry. I have two questions for you. Here we go. So this accelerationist paradigm. Yes. Wouldn't that in the last instance suggest that technology determines the aesthetics of metal? I totally agree. And you know how I feel about that. Yes. Um, and then the second one is, yeah, what's the role of the studio here? So like, is, does this in part explain or help to explain like the emergence of you know of bedroom metal and bedroom recordings of one man bands and right, one person right, bands. Right, 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 right. Okay, this is something I struggle with a lot because the 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 sort of I guess I don't know what I want to say. The kind of elitist side of me would be like a consequence of everybody being able to have a band. Right, you get a logo, you get a Facebook page. That's what you do first. <laughs> and then you have, you know, you, you, you pirate some software or something like this, and you get a sound card, you plug in, and you, you have your own bedroom black metal band or whatever. Um, which is interesting because black metal is a genre where it's like, it's okay to sound like shit. It's like, that's part of the aesthetic. So it actually is fit for people who don't have a lot of money, who don't have a lot of access to technology. Like, there's no bedroom dream theaters. <laughs> there's no bedroom yeses out there there's only that's why it's called bedroom black metal but then people are like well there's just there's just this uh there's no quality control right and i think i think we might agree with the technology thing that there's always been that the window is just bigger there's always been too many bands there's always been too many authors self-publishing on Amazon now. Everybody's an author, everybody's in a band, everybody's in, and, and in many ways, of course, the utopic Marxist democratic part of me would be like, that's great. But then there's a sort of, oh, but there's a lot of terrible music out there. <laughs> and a lot of really bad prose. <coughs> um, so technology, I'm in total agreement. One, because I, I don't care too much for humans, but technology <laughs> is the determining factor here in forming what we do as artists. Yes. And in terms of the studio in particular, the studio, the limitations, are an opportunity. You know, I was asked, well, how do you do your music live? And I said, we don't. We can't. <laughs> so we're limited by two guitars, a bass, a drum set, and one vocalist. And, uh, you know, if you're coming to the show, you'll hear how terrible that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But it's not going to sound like the records because we can't. And so technology is purely constitutive of how one expresses himself. I don't accept any kind of gestures towards a sort of uh, genuine subjectivity, I think it's always going to be a sort of external limitations that help form the subject. This is our postmodern, post-human, right? That sort of idea. So good. That's great. 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 Any, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I totally agree with your um, your theme here, and I love talking about bands like Atheist at University. But why do you think it is that, um, in spite of this, heavy metal still looked so down upon by the the public mm -hmm. yeah. and you know whenever I'm trying to explain to people like who don't normally listen to metal why I love Cannibal Corpse or something right, right, right. I have no idea what to say you know it's just like because <laughs> it's awesome because it's brutal because it's <laughs> um, you know what you were kind of saying when uh, you're describing Agaloc to your colleagues it's really difficult to you know get across how you actually right. feel about the music why do you think that is still um, but one thing I'm, I'm thankful I don't play in Cannibal Corpse, <laughs> right, professor, because they would, the first thing the professors would do would read the lyrics, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thankful that Agalock, you know, okay, we have these sort of pagan heathen themes, but there's nothing like you know, politically dubious or, or disgusting or satanic. So like, no one's gonna be offended if they read our lyrics or look at our imagery. Um, they're just gonna, you know, they'll just see like, it's like they can tell it's dark music. But, but I mean heavy metal very generally, yeah. you know, it's yeah, still so, very underground. Yeah, no, I totally music. agree, because I get this a lot of time too. Um, I think that the question goes back to, and we were talking about this in the car, Sam Dunn's work, you know, the documentaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first one, A Headbanger's Journey, that's for your parents to watch. It's not yeah. for us, yeah. right? I think we all agree. That's what, like, when your mom's like, why do you listen to Campbell Corpse? He's like, well, take that, 
But the thing is, the thesis he provides in that documentary, I find, like, really banal, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we know what that is. Like, heavy metal is, it's rebellion, it's, it's angst, it's transgression, it's these sort of things. And it is, it is those things. But so is a lot of literature and a lot of, and a lot of philosophy and a lot of cinema. And I feel like that's tired. We, we can't keep talking about how heavy metal is where the alienated teenager goes and finds some sort of utopia amongst his friends who are also alienated, ironically. And instead, we have to ask the question that Sam Dunn asks in Global Metal. That's the documentary where I felt like, okay, that's really a good example of theoretically approaching heavy metal. And looking at particularly with the religious aspect between like Orphan Land and Israel and the sort of Muslim metal bands and how that works together. So we've played Israel back in 2011. And we also got a lot of flack about that politically, which I totally understand and accept. Um, I wanted to go there to see things with my own eyes. But there was a moment where we recognized that the stakes were very high politically in heavy metal. You know, what does it mean to play Israel in, in, in the times that we were in? And, but like we were talking about, Rob Zombie, whether you think he's metal or not, I don't know, but just he said it perfectly. He said, no one listens to Slayer for a summer. <laughs> you know, so, okay, if you're, if you're Jewish and I'm Muslim and I'm pro-Palestine and I hate Israel, but we love Slayer. I honestly believe because heavy metal is a very cult genre and the passion for that, Whenever I see someone with a band shirt, you know, way back in the day, if someone had a carcass shirt on, we were best friends. Because I knew that that person had to do research to find carcass. And this is another interesting discussion we can have, because I don't think you have to do as much research as we did back in the day. But that suggested you were a scholar, and essentially you had to seek that out. And that kind of drive and passion transcended religion, class, race, sexual orientation, all those sort of identity lines. I feel like, and I think the same for jazz and classical as well. That's the stuff we should be working on. And we should be working further on you know, the role of, 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 of queer sexuality, of race, in heavy metal. Because there's a lot of work to be done, that's, you know, people don't really want to talk about it, you know, but like, it's time to do so. So when people ask you, like, why do you like heavy metal, you can say, because heavy metal raises incredibly interesting questions about tribalism. And I think that's what it comes down to, is that whether you're Israeli or you're uh, Iranian, at the end of the day, that tribalism almost transcends those, 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 those lines. And I don't think you get that with country music. Well, I'm quite adamant you don't get that with country music. <laughs> you don't get that with pop music. No one, no one is going to transcend religious lines over Britney Spears, but they will over Slayer, they will over Metallica, and that's why those bands have played those areas in the, country, the, the world. Huh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. But, but yeah, so are there other folks too? But that's a very good question. That's, that's how I would justify heavy metal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems like you might not be able to transcend like hardcore Christian lines with uh. Yeah. 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 Well, and this is an interesting question that we, we can also talk about. The anti-Christian thing is almost so banal and accepted and norm, but if you're anti-Jewish, <laughs> and we, we were theorizing about what does that mean? You know, do you know Christians suffered tremendous persecution? Uh, Jews have suffered it, perhaps maybe more more recently. Obviously, right? You know, because I don't really believe in the war on Christmas, okay? That's not really <laughs> happening. I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in America, it's like Fox News, it's war on Christmas. And maybe that's it, that we, 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 the Jewish question becomes a very, very troubling one, as opposed to the Christian one. Because Christian, I think, I think with Black Sabbath too, even though they wore the crosses, but, you know, flirtations with the devil and Satanism was there from the very beginning, and so it has become normalized in the fabric of it. It's become a generic convention, whereas any other kind of anti- theistic sort of uh, habit, and in fact, if you are anti-Jewish, I mean, it's, it's, you're going to be picketed, and, and, and I think rightfully so, but then I think, well, why? Why do we make those differences? Who has, who gets the, who gets the out of, out of jail card, you know? Like, you can say what you want about Burzum, right? This is a very problematic thing. Like, I love Burzum, unapologetically. I don't like Bart Beekerns, you know? I think I find his views reprehensible. But then, you know, we read Heidegger in philosophy departments, and Heidegger is the, this is, this is, this is to be the tweet that you can use. Heidegger is philo philosophy's Bard Beekers. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Nazi and wrote in favor of the Nazi party, but like no one's gonna be like, well, we can't read Being in Time. <laughs> right? But also like, you know, the, the whole Antifa argument is like, you're not gonna become a Nazi because you listen to his likes of Taras. You're smarter than that. You know, if you if you put on uh, what's a real, give me give me like a white supremacist black metal band? Absurd. Argus Lund. Absurd. It was who? Argus Lund. Yeah, that. Like, 
Like, you could play that for me, and I think you're all smart enough to be like, I can make the distinction differentiation. And that's what I think a lot of, you know, anti-fascist people don't maybe see. You don't give people enough credit. They're actually really smart to differentiate and problematize that. Because that's what philosophy has resisted doing, I think, with I until recently. And Paul DeMond as well. But good. Did I answer that question? Sorry. Well, no, 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 no. So remind me, what was the question again? Well, I mean, you, you kind of... The uh, anti-Christian. It was more of, you can't transcend, like, Christian lives. Right, okay, so you're asking about Christian metal. This is where, like, I have to be, okay, how can I be academic about this? Because when I was a kid, not when I was a kid, but when I was younger, when I, before I, you know, when I was just an angry, blonde-haired teenager, it was like, you know, oh, Christian metal doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> Christian black metal, all this. I don't know how to approach that question. Because without looking at the larger phenomena of Christian rock music, which I've always found to be more in service of proselytizing, perhaps, than making substantial music. And that's probably a sweeping generalization that if, if you identify as Christian and you listen to me, you might critique me for. Because I have friends who I went to high school with who were, went off and became Christian, uh, I don't say rock star, but very, 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 very popular. And it was so insulated, too. But then I think, well, heavy metal is very insulated as well. So I don't know if that's a helpful comparison. Um, I, you know, I think the music has to be judged upon the music first and foremost. I think you can have incredibly challenging Christian music and challenging Christian metal. And the same way that I'm not going to become an anti-Semite by listening to Burzum, I'm probably not going to become a Christian by listening to any Christian metal band, no matter how overt they might be. You know, that's how I would approach that. Any other, any other questions? I just wanted to ask, yes. uh, when you summarized the, uh, the theoretical introduction, you concluded with this kind of spatial metaphor for the history of the development of metal. Yeah. You had this kind of uh, the arc, the enlightenment. Marked by, and I guess it seemed to me that you were saying that was kind of an imaginary line. Yeah. And in fact, there's no such line at all. Right, right, right. It, what we have are a series of, I guess, events, or yeah. you also used the word ruptures. Right, right. Is that, uh, that was, might have been a casual usage of the term. But I'm just wondering if you can maybe explain that model a little bit more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Foucault, Foucault approaches history in terms of ruptures and accidents, I think. You know, things happen that we then, like, oh, well, of course that happened because of A, B, and C. And so, again, it's that, it's in hindsight we explain things that seem unexplainable, right? And there's, and you probably all feel this, there's an impulse to narrativize phenomena, to put things that happen into a kind of coherent teleological, you know, space time, so it makes sense. Because it's far more terrifying to be like, it's meaningless, it's, it's, it, you, how can you explain things that happen? Like what just happened in America in Charleston, in South Carolina, right? I believe South Carolina, right? Charleston, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, how do you begin to even put that in any kind of coherent context? I don't know. So, rupture for me is a much more violent transgression of a linear timeline. It leaves its mark on it. It, it, it rends it open, like rips it open. And I feel like there are albums like Atheist that did that because when I first heard the first few notes of that Atheist record, I'm like, those aren't power chords. You know, and then that weird bass breakdown. I'm like, that's jazz. Metal came from blues, so there was this like, I mean, there must have been a conscious effort to say, no more blues. We're done with blues. Mm -hmm. We're going to access jazz, right? Because metal traditionally came from blues. Mm -hmm. We can we can follow that line, and that was gone away. We had to break out of the timeline and look at what's going on in jazz that allowed this to happen. Much like with Gorguts, what's going on in contemporary classical music to make this happen? We have to leave the timeline. So there is this rupture. Where we have to depart from that and look at what's happening over here mediated by technology. Because I'm sure like Luke LeMay only probably heard that kind of music because he could go to his local classical record store and buy it, because I don't know how often Penderecki tours. He's, he's a composer. Yeah, he's a composer, right. He's, I, okay, I think he, I met him once, he's like, he studied with Penderecki. But like, the, the only way that I found that kind of music was through a music store. And so you have to leave the timeline. It becomes ruptured because we exit that and access some other timeline. So it becomes a kind of fragmented rhizome sort of thing. I think. So, I mean, I don't want to push the metaphor too far. No, do push it far. I, well, I guess I'm just wondering, like, you, you mentioned rhizome, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, what is the structure of the history of metal Yeah. with these ruptures involved? Like, That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we, you know, say, say something gets thrown up and then it scatters widely in all sorts of disparate pools or something like right, that. Right, right. Uh, and then they each carry on in their own way. But I mean, there, on the one hand, I've got, you know, the, I don't know, earthquake or geyser or something. But then you're talking about rhizome. I, 
I, I, I, I don't want to put that's why I don't want to push the metaphor. Yeah, I like I like the rhizome <laughs> metaphor. Because one thing I think the internet has done is to, is, is literally horizontalize. You know, so if I start a bedroom black metal band tomorrow, I, I can be just as accessible as Metallica. And so that horizontalizes, so you don't have a hierarchical top-down structure anymore. So the structure you're suggesting, one that I would, I would push is what I'm trying to talk about, is that it's not, it's not upward, it is horizontal. And these ruptures, okay, it'd be like an earthquake or a, a volcano. I think it is like that, but on a very horizontal field. If, and then we have to look over this timeline, what's going on in jazz, what's going on in modern classical and the avant-garde, what's going on in klezmer music. I mean, like, they're no longer seen as some sort of you know, arrange any kind of hierarchical thing, you know, like, well, why do you listen to metal? That's such a, you know, a brain dead, you know, uh, uh, caveman type music, right? But no, it, it's, it's just as meaningful as classical music or as jazz. And I think, I think the rise of metaphor is more helpful, but that's exactly what I'm trying to work through. I'm trying to understand how things happened in heavy metal. Because it's weird to me that it's 45 years old and we have come so insanely far at such a quick, in such a quick time. So that's what I'm struggling with right now. Yeah. How, do, you, uh, do you look at the spatial or geographic aspect of metal at all? Because it seems to me that we have mm -hmm. all these little tight communities. Yeah, yeah. They're right. very rich, right? Right. I mean, I know Victoria very well. There's so much going on here. Mm. Uh, and it's not a far stretch of the imagination to think that that same thing is happening in, I don't know how many cities around the world. Mm -hmm. um, now, yeah, maybe that's getting too empirically oriented, but uh, yeah, do you, do you no, consider I consider geography. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, and I thought about doing my. I was thinking about writing a book about this, where I would do it, 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 it geograph, geographically. Think, but what happened in Tampa in the nineties, early nineties? What happened there that produced so many great bands? What happened in Norway? You know, in the early nineties, the second wave of black metal, and also the little more obscure things. Like, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Finnish grind rock scene. Zizma. Praxism, yeah. Sunride, okay, like weird, happy grindcore. <laughs> a convulse, not convulse his first record, but their second record, Reflections. Again, just, just there it is, right? Um, happy grindcore is what it sounds like, and I'm like, what happened? What happened in Finland at that time that produced that? It sounds weird. Yeah, I was gonna say the first time I heard Zizma, I immediately thought like Beach Boys and Carcass. <laughs> exactly. Agaloc are huge fans of that stuff. We yeah. have flirted with putting that stuff out on our own label, Demo Wrong Arts. We like we because we know we have we have all the demos. We use the tape trade all the stuff like Sunride, uh, all the praxism stuff. Praxism, amorphous, almost better than amorphous. Who? Praxism. I almost I put them on the same level as amorphous, but amorphous, is, you know. No. But uh, you know, thinking in terms of what happened there, and also what happened to in the Legion of Noir, right? The French black metal scene. Like what's going on there to produce that? And also, um, it came out of that with the whole Despello, Mega, Blue Dust, Nord, that kind of thing. What is it that made them write music like that? That's interesting to me, and that's a geographical question, because you have to take it in terms of history, cultural, social, the climate of that particular moment. You know? I mean, people even, they, they throw in the term Cascadian Black Mill, you've heard this phrase, right? Absolutely. You know, and like, what's happening here? Well, here it's like, you get these environmental hippies, and they, they're trying to, you know, <laughs> bunch of tree huggers. Is <laughs> <laughs> and it's people accuse us of starting it, but we're like, no, 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 no. It was just an aesthetic. We're not environmental terrorists. This isn't, we're from Portland, not Eugene. <laughs> so major difference. No, I mean, I, again, I, we're, I, I do love nature and conservation, and I, I define myself very much as environmental, liberal, progressive, and whatnot with this, but um, the Cascadian scene, I think, was rooted in that kind of, you know, wolves in the throne room, that kind of stuff, you know, and, I, and nothing against them, but it's, it's kind of black metal, but instead of a satanic project, it's, it's a tree-hugging project. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to, hopefully they don't read that. They're, they're nice guys. Yeah, Sean. Um, You've been focusing your talk a lot about musical influences, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of different ways I can go with this question, but I'm wondering if for, if for you, metal, there's beyond just the music. Is there a, a culture there that, mm -hmm. that you see yourself as being part of? Or? Yeah, I mean, after every show, you know, I, I like to come out and, and talk. And I talk so much about academia, because a lot, of, a lot of the people who come to the shows are, are students. And we talk at length about their major, should I go to grad school? That kind of question. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm an advisor all of a sudden. <laughs> you gotta think about financial aid, you gotta get support, you gotta be a TA, and that kind of thing. Um, so the culture is, look, there's been nothing more 
rewarding socially, nothing more intimate than heavy metal. I mean, uh, when, when I was much younger and wasn't wearing glasses and I was in the pit, you know, you know the classic thing, if someone falls down, you bring them right back up, right? And I fell down a lot and I brought up a lot of people. And uh, you, don't get that, you don't get that anywhere else. There's a, such a tribalism that it's, it's such a strong connection. And playing live affords me that connection to interact with you and to see how the music provides a reciprocal relationship. And I think that's very beautiful and that's very meaningful and that does impact at least me personally and how I think about music and art. Um, and, uh, but everything influences you. Um, and very early on with Agaloc, I was like, we already look like we're from Norway. <laughs> the, the Pale Folk Horde, that's all the Columbia Gorge, but, and Andy Winter, or my good friend down there at the back, might, might uh, challenge me on this, but it, it's, just, it's just as good as Norway's fjords. <laughs> but if you look, if you look at the Pell Folklore booklet, it's like it's a kind of epic Norwegian thing. I'm like, but we're not, we're not going to do the thing where we have the Nietzsche quote or something. <laughs> like, no, because I think all those bands misread Nietzsche. That's a whole other conversation. I would say we're going to have Thoreau, we're going to do Walden, we're going to do Emerson, we're going to we're going to embrace the American transcendentalist, and that's our philosophy. So it's a very conservative effort to be an American metal band and like not run from. You know, it's like we're the McDonald's and shit like this. But like, we weren't going to run from our intellectual history as Americans, you know. So, you know, I, I, I use Kerouac a lot of time on tour and, and in old blurbs and things like this. So that all really, I mean, Meryl the Spirit is directly lifted, again, we steal everything, is lifted from Walden. And the scene in Walden where he wants to suck all the Meryl out of life, right, it's this line. So my first idea for the album was Meryl of Life, and John, we always Google things. Wish Opeth did the same thing, but he, he would Google things, and he was, he was like, there's too much marrow of life, and so he made marrow of the spirit, but that's, everything is, is definitely, it's all patchwork, it's bricolage, you know, as Derrida would say, it's, there's no originality, it's just, it's all being weaved together, I guess, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a question in relation to your concept of an event. Yes. And you, speak, you spoke about it um, musically, mainly, mm -hmm. and like, say, atheist, and with a personal presence. Yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering what role does the aesthetic play and kind of like the imagery that comes with it. Like you talk about Cynic too and like I look at Focus and I look at the lyrics from that album and even the cover. Mm. It's something, it's also different. It's mm. something that's not following yeah. the same. Yeah. So, and, and Agalog has a lot of that too, so yeah. maybe you could speak. speak yeah, about. yeah, absolutely. Because um, I think the way we carry ourselves on stage is not very metal. You know, like I cut all my hair off. I don't stand in one place and headbang and you know, sort of thing like this. I, but I do wear all black. But like, you know, when Atheist Cynic came out, and uh, other guys in the band can tell you that they were on, the first thing Cynic did when they went on tour, they went on tour with Sinister <laughs> and Cannibal Corpse. They got th shit thrown at them constantly. And they were wearing Bermuda pants. Okay? And they held their guitars up really, really high. And Atheist did the same thing, like short Bermuda shorts. He did not fit in it at all. And I don't know where that comes from, but the aesthetic of Adlock definitely is, is more influenced, again, by cinema, by black and white films, things like that. And so that is allowed because, I mean, if it wasn't for this kind of accelerated digital world we live in, I would not have had access to the films of Ingmar Bergman. I mean, I grew up in a small town called Kamitz, Washington, right? Not too far from Portland. I, there's no art house cinema there. But now, with Netflix, with so many things like this, I can watch... Tarkovsky films, I can watch Bergman films, and that affects the aesthetic of Agalock. So we really do. I mean, if I do meet a colleague and they ask what kind of music do you play, I call it Bergman metal. <laughs> it's existential, it's black and white. It's, if Bergman had a metal band, it would be, I like, I'd like, I mean, maybe too much, but I like to think of it as that. So the aesthetic definitely comes from, I think, access to those sorts of things that women typically have. Until then, I was watching Star Wars and Flash Gordon, which is not. <laughs> that's what you grew up on. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you actually touched on it, but uh, at least not in, in depth. But I'm wondering about the connection of the cinematic influences on Agalog. Just right. In reference to it here. Yes. Well, it, I'm very fortunate to work with another guitar player who never took guitar lessons, who never studied music, and thinks in terms of images. And literally, we'll be in the studio, and he'll be like, I want this guitar part to sound like you're flowing over a mountain. Right? And I'm like, A minor. Right? <laughs> I reduce everything to the empirical. I'm like, that, that sounds so dark. I'm like, well, it's a, it's a diminished bit. I mean, that's why it sounds so dark. So I kill the romance form. That's our relationship. <laughs> um, 
but he speaks in terms of images, which is helpful because we had that relationship as two songwriters in the same band, as that we watched the same films together. Um, he doesn't understand if I'm like, let's, let's modulate to G major now or something like that. It, it makes no sense to him. Or play me a C, we won't do it. Um, but he speaks in terms of images. So, so many times, every album we've done has been a film that has really brought things together. For the mantle, it was Jim Jarmusch's Dead Man. We watched that film incessantly, and I even lifted a little guitar lick from the Neil Young soundtrack, and it's on there. And that's, that was hugely influential. And for Meryl of the Spirit is a Bellatar film called Brickmeister Harmonies. And that was constantly in our heads, and that provided a blueprint. So we weren't thinking in terms of notes. We were thinking in terms of, how can we make this sound like a Bellatar film? That was the approach. So that's how film has influenced us probably more than other metal bands. Absolutely. <clears throat> Which film was it that you said uh, you drew from Dead Man? Dead Man, yeah. Sorry, which, which, sorry. which director? Which album oh, the did mantle. you draw the man from Dead Man? The you? Mantle. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the film? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. <clears throat> you don't ever play the film in the back, do you? No, no, we, we've done projections, yeah. but we've never done a film like, like Neurosis, and, but yeah. uh, we wanted to, <laughs> but uh, never have, no. Any other questions? Is there? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious how Tomorrow Never Comes came about, because that was just a solo piece. That's actually a very good question because it's academic, because I was taking an honors class in my uh, last year of undergrad, and I took a class on, it was a science, and they called the Domain of the Sciences, and we looked at all the major movements in science, like birth control, uh, and one was, you know, uh, schizophrenia. And I remember watching a film that was, you know, showing schizophrenics interacting. And there was this one really moving scene between a father and a schizophrenic son. And that is where the sample from... Yeah, yeah, I ended up seeing that in a psych class and like sat there the whole time really? thinking, like, why do I know this guy's voice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, know, I don't know anything about it. I went up to the professor. I'm like, hey, can I borrow that tape for a couple days? And I borrowed the tape and we put it over Tomorrow Never Come. And the title Tomorrow Never Come came from Twin Peaks Fire Walk with me. There's this one moment where the guy shouts, Tomorrow Never Come. And I was like, that's a great title. So again, we ripped everything off. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was really fascinated by schizophrenia and mental illness. And that's where all that came from. It was, it was a hand in the back I saw. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering what some of the main influences and inspirations were for remember writing um, uh, Ashes Against the Grain. Ah. Uh, well, okay, so Ashes came after we started playing live. So when we first started, we weren't playing live because it was just the three of us. And uh, John played drums and sang and played guitar. He didn't have enough limbs to do all three at the same time. So we were just, we're going studio band. And when we started playing live before Ashes, we realized how much we could do with limited things. And we felt more like, well, we're a rock band. We're a hard rock band. And so Ashes was like all about simplifying. So it was, again, it was the, the contours of the live scene that actually influenced how we did Ashes. So Ashes is a simpler record. It's not a lot of acoustics, not a lot of nylon strength, not a lot of, you know, upright bass. I mean, we were doing everything but the kitchen sink on the mantle. Had a ukulele. That, I almost got in a fist fight with John over the, uh, the, mand the, uh, the mandolin. On Desolation song, okay. All right, I wrote that song, and I'm like, I want a mandolin. John was like, no, we're <laughs> no, we're doing it. And, and then our producer was like, yeah, be really careful, because all of a sudden you're just sailing down Venice. <laughs> and after he said that, John was like, we're definitely not doing it. <laughs> but I won that fight. But I won, that nearly came to blows. That's the only time he and I almost got in a fight in the studio. But fortunately, I won, because I really think it works. So we were reducing. To answer your question, actually, it was all about reducing, simplifying, and being just rock. Yeah, sounds really great. One more question. Thank you. Um, Oh boy, this is... Do you feel like the acceleration is complicating the age? The age of what? What do you mean the age? The period? The age that we're living in. It's complicating. I would say, okay, the one thing I would point out, because like my students, I mean, you're all being wonderful, because if you're my students, you'd just be on your phones right now texting. <laughs> so on one hand, I think it's having that effect of, of distraction. I do believe that multitasking, I think, is a myth. I don't think we can really truly multitask. And it's like when you're cooking, because I know you, you cook a lot. Yeah, if, you, if, you, if you're stir-frying some vegetables, and you got something in the oven, and you're over here doing this, something's going to get burnt. <laughs> something will always burn. So I feel like accelerationism has provided a, a kind of encouraging multitasking, which I think fragments our consciousness, fragments our focus, and I don't think my students are picking up on the subtleties of the literature that I introduced them to. So I think it has that, but I also don't want to make any sweeping like it's bad or good. 
It's just something that is, and it has these sort of consequences. Many of which is great, like you can go go listen to Zizma and Praxism and go watch Bellatara films like now. And but it also fragments, and I think it, it goes against the tribalism that we're talking about. But, so I think it does trouble, as you put it, trouble the age. So uh, look, thank you so much for coming. It means last yeah. last question. Okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, please. Um, I was kind of thinking about how you said the event is going to become the norm, mm -hmm. and how that is kind of like a saturation almost of metal. Mm -hmm. well, I might have missed it. You might have mentioned it, but um, what do you think the solution? I don't think there has to be a solution. I don't think I, I'm perfectly welcoming of this disintegration of old genres, and that's that's where I agree with the accelerationists. Like they want their nihilistic and their whole attack on capitalism. They want it to end, right? And I again, I don't agree. I don't think capitalism will ever end. But I would equate capitalism with musical genres. I want the genres to collapse. I'm fine with that. I think we should accelerate it. And I think the hyphenated genre names are indicative of our struggle <laughs> to keep them. But really, we just need to let them go. Also, should let capitalism go. That's another class. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me back to the question about music and culture in metal, because yeah. it's one thing to say that the, the music disintegrates, but what happens to the culture with that explosion yeah. disintegration? Does you lose that aspect? No, I think we become more inclusive. I think it's a beautiful thing. Really, I do. I mean, I think uh, we will just all become one tribe. Is that too utopic? That's too utopic. That's great. <laughs> I think that's fine. I welcome the disintegration of labels and lines, divisions, and you know. And I think heavy metal, although I, I argue that it was this inclusive thing, but I think it's. So I just had a thought, like, but just the timeline for metal is so short. Like the lifetime. Right. It's if we are accelerating so quick, like there's not a lot of time. It's an exponent, exponential growth. So. Yeah, I give it about a week. <laughs> okay. Seriously though, like all the venues you play, you've got to play the metal venues, right? And then yeah. the punk venues. So like, how does that, like architecturally and culturally, like, go back to Shema's question, how does that play out? Because I, you know, I'll say it, I, I, don't, I don't go to the metal venues. Yeah, no, right? I totally punk venues. Yeah. Right? And you know, we're it's the over, man. We yeah. crossed yeah. over. The only thing is, like two metal records. They made two metal records. <laughs> And their, their electronic output's like 80% of their over. But they're always going to be in the metal section. So again, space determines, like, they can't break out. We, we, we met Garm at, at Roadburn, and, you know, they're playing 60 psychedelic music. And we're like, too bad no one's going to hear in the store, because you're always going to be with Dark Throne and Burzum and Candle Corpse. He's aware of it, so... I don't know what to do about that, but that that does that's that's something I should. You played the croc though in Seattle, right? I did. See, yeah, okay. yeah, well, well, we played the and we played the Blind Pig, I think, in in, in all big grunge punk rock venues. Yeah. Right. And you know, our drummer was in a punk rock band. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you much. so much, Jackson. Yeah. I just hope we have this much of the show tonight. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll, feel, I'll feel very vain if I had more attendance than, than the actual band. No, no, no. But thank you very much for coming. It means a lot to me. It really does. Yeah. It was a really good time.